Hi! In this video, I'm going to connect Purim with today's anti-Semitism and with the devastation we are witnessing in Ukraine. Jews around the world recently celebrated a holiday called Purim. Purim is a celebration of the Book of Esther in the Jewish Bible. The Book of Esther makes the point that in every generation, there is someone in the world trying to become king of the hill by extreme force. The story of the book of Esther takes place in the Persian Empire in biblical times. At the time of the story, the Persian emperor or king was tolerant of the various communities in his empire or kingdom. He let them practice their own culture and religion and ruled over a peaceful coexistence. But there was a man in the story named Haman or Haman who wasn't as tolerant. Haman was the most trusted advisor of the king and was allowed to make decisions on behalf of the king. In the story, Haman decided that all the communities in the kingdom must convert to the Persian culture and religion. The Jews refused, which Haman must have considered an act of treason that was punishable by death. He decided to kill all the Jews. He picked up a date for the killing from a ball like a raffle called Pur in Hebrew, and thus the name Purim. Esther was a young Jewish woman who was sent on a mission to reverse Haman's decision to kill all, all the Jews. Her, her mission was successful. In this mission, she herself was a part of the strategy. She became a queen and was able to whisper in the king's ear what Haman was planning to do. There are two lessons to learn from this poem story. The first lesson is that people who seek power and control by extreme force don't usually stop pursuing their goal on their own. Almost always, the process of becoming king of the hill is a psychological bottomless pit. Unless they are being stopped, they are most likely to continue their effort to fill up the bottomless pit with complete disregard to losses and damages. The second lesson we learn from the poem story is that conventional strategies are most often useless in stopping the king of the hill. Almost always, it takes unconventional strategies to stop them, and it takes a think tank to come up with a strategy that is most likely to work in each case. <clears throat> in the case of Esther, it might be fair to say that Esther was an agent that penetrated the royal court. She had an agent handler named Mordechai, and most likely her community organized a think tank where they brainstormed different possible strategies. The connection between Purim and today's anti-Semitism and between Purim and Ukraine is quite clear. It's the king of the hill. But the connection between Ukraine and anti-Semitism is not as clear because the king of the hill who is currently destroying Ukraine is not in war with the Jews. The connection is made by the anti-Semitic propaganda machine. This machine that is in constant war with the Jews is also in itself a bottomless pit. It seeks power and control at any cost, and the only resolution it is willing to accept is the total annihilation of Judaism, Israel, or both. I chose two examples in random to present here, one from the right and one from the left. Basically, all of them have the same core message. The right claims that Judaism doesn't have the right to exist, and the left claims that Israel doesn't have the right to exist. The right and the left feed each other, and often it is difficult to tell if someone is from the right or the left. But in the big picture of anti-Semitism, it makes little difference which side is spewing the hatred? 
when Putin started to build up military equipment next to the Ukraine border, and the tension started to build up, the anti-Semitic machine went to work. On the right, a retired United States colonel said, We have a huge problem with the people who are wealthy, as the Russians used to call certain individuals ruthless cosmopolitans. He is referring to the Jews. They, the Jews, are largely responsible for the condition that we are here today. When the invasion of Ukraine was in full force on the left, an associate professor wrote an article called The World of Inconsistencies Between Ukraine, the Middle East, and Beyond. In this article, he compares Russia bombing of Ukraine to Israel retaliation against Hamas after years of Israel tolerating relentless bombing from Gaza. He then complains that the world is not sympathetic enough with Gaza as it is with Ukraine. I am going to say something that sounds contradicting. The brand of antisemitism of the two examples here is sometimes called good faith antisemitism. You might be wondering, how can antisemitism be good faith? There is nothing good about it. What makes it good faith is that it is open, overt, clear. It says what it means and it means what it says. It is nefarious. It claims to cause damage and harm, but because we can understand its position, it is considered good faith. On the opposite side is bad faith antisemitism, where it is covert, unclear, hidden under the surface, and difficult to prove. Something just as important to understand about antisemitism is that it is not one item. Conceptually, antisemitism is one abstract item. <clears throat> but when we think about it as one item and stretch it into a global item, it is how to imagine how to stop it. Very often people ask me, how do you plan to stop antisemitism? As if it is one single item that demands one solution. This is, of course, impossible. And the conclusion is, do nothing. <coughs> if we look at the book of Esther, the Persian Empire was one item in a small world where there was one Haman to defeat. That one defeat saved all the Jews in the Persian Empire in one action. But the reality of today is different. Today, there are many Hamans in many communities, and each Haman needs to be defeated with a unique, unconventional strategy for each different Haman. When we break down the problem of anti-Semitism into small parts and into defeating one Haman at a time, locally, with the best strategy for each Haman, it should start to appear doable. The book of Esther shows us that it's really not a question of who has more money or foot soldiers, but who has the better perspective or strategy. And there is one more thing to consider that is very important. The bulk of antisemitism is in the form of microaggression. Antisemitism that is not violent, not committing assault, vandalism, or harassment is often called antisemitic microaggression. Why is this important? Because this is what we encounter day to day in our communities. Furthermore, because next to targeting Judaism or Israel, each one of us is fair game target for anti-Semitic microaggression. As for bad faith anti-Semitism, here are also two examples. The first one is the classic example of the Dreyfus affair. 
Dreyfus was an officer in the French military who was charged with treason that he didn't commit because he was Jewish. The conventional strategy of exonerating him through the legal system was useless. He eventually prevailed due to his community intervention and the use of community pressure. His case was published and caused much uproar in the Jewish community. He was then released from prison for political reasons. His community figured out that as much as politicians hate the Jews, possibly they don't want to lose the Jewish votes. That was unconvention the unconventional strategy that defeated anti-Semitism in this case. As the Book of Esther teaches, Lesson 1, it is up to us to stop anti-Semitic local Haymans because they are not going to stop on their own. Lesson 2, we need to use unconventional strategies to stop each one of them, which implies forming, forming community think tanks. The second example here is from my own experience. I encountered the King of the Hill in my community when attending the Dawson program in a museum of art in San Diego. I was charged and discharged with some cockamamie accusation that doesn't make much sense. I approached the King of the Hill in my story, which was the executive director of the museum, asking her to have a conversation about antisemitism based on my experience at the museum. But her response was simple. They have the right to hate you. That was the response of the most prominent person in the museum. The door was shut closed. Prior to this, and connected with it, the representative of the museum's human resources tried to convince me that anti-Semitism is a normal part of a community diversity. In order to appease me, the president of the board sent me an email saying that they are working with a consultant with an expertise in microaggression. I asked some docents at the museum about it, and their response was that there has been no microaggression training for the docent. I wasn't surprised, and neither were they, because at least in two prior occasions, diversity training was not provided as scheduled and as was documented. In my case, all conventional strategies by now have been exhausted to include a petition calling for the resignation of the executive director. According to the Book of Esther, most likely it would take an unconventional strategy to stop this king of the hill. I hope that now you can appreciate the universal wisdom of the Book of Esther. It teaches us that while being at war with anti-Semitism or any other king of the hill, we cannot afford not fighting back. It is not hard to see that local Haymans are multiplying freely, becoming increasingly more aggressive with no consequences in sight. The message I would like to leave you with is that it is doable to take down the Haymans in our local communities one Hayman at a time. If we change our own perspective and use unconventional strategy as the book of Esther urges us to do. Be well and start thinking unconventionally. Bye.